What is your earliest childhood memory? That's a funny one because it's very clear and I remember being maybe two years old, two years and a half in my crib um, with my diapers wet and I was kind of in downward facing dog like with my head on the bed and looking at everything upside down and I remember seeing my PJs like just dripping pee. Um, that is my earliest childhood memory. <laughs> Can you describe uh, your childhood for me in one word? Happy. Can you explain the impact of what you do on other people, how you see it? Probably I generate change. What do uh, romantic relationships represent to you? A very important part of life. It's kind of like a really either sweet or bitter or a, you know, ingredient that comes with life. What's the one thing, the one trait that you won't accept in the people around you? Deceit. How do you think other people see you? I would guess it depends who, but I'm guessing for some reason people tend to think that I'm very serious, but I think of myself as anything but serious. But it, it takes me some time to warm up generally, so I understand why that impression can be. When I ask you this question, what's the first thing that comes into your head uh, in life? What's been your hardest moment? Finding out my partner was cheating on me. What's the one change you'd like to see in the world? Well, given the current situation, I would say peace. What's the most frequent lie you tell other people? I'll be there on time. <laughs> <laughs> I can vouch for that. If anything, what would you like to get out of this interview? Satisfy my curiosity around this. Excellent. Thank you. Let's, uh, let's put the lights on. And lights on. Hello, how are you? Good. How are you? Very good. Thank you. Um, it's lovely to meet you. Uh, we, when we start, you know, naturally the people I'm interviewing aren't super well known generally anyway. But um, I always have to remind myself that like we're literally introducing you from scratch. Mm -hmm. So can you please just start by introducing yourself, your name and where you're from and, and all that sort of lovely stuff that okay. get the boring things out of the way and then we'll, <laughs> we'll find out who you really are. <laughs> um, my name is Natalia. I am from Colombia. I've been living in Bali for the past six years. I am an art therapist. Um, I have a master's degree in art therapy and creativity development from uh, the Pratt Institute in New York. I am uh, also a trauma-informed trained therapist, which means that I work uh, with people that have undergone trauma. Um, do you want to go a little bit deeper into my CV or that's enough? Where I've whatever trained, you, what I've whatever done. You, whatever you want to show. Um, I've been working and I, I started uh, my private practice in Vietnam um, after having practiced um, training in New York in the NYU hospital and then in the Metropolitan Hospice uh, Jewish Health, no, Jewish MJHS, Metropolitan Jewish Health Services um, in hospice care. And then um, I moved to Vietnam when I started um, doing my private practice. And there I worked with Pacific Links, an NGO that works with human trafficking survivors and uh, girls that have escaped that have been uh, sold as brides or as prostitutes to China. And they managed to escape and come back down. Wow. And so that was um, a really difficult but beautiful part um, of my journey as a therapist um, and that took me to you know working a lot with uh, trauma survivors and girls and women that have been abused I bet. Which, yeah and um, after that I moved to Bali um, with my partner and we have been here for six years now and I have a little private practice and sometimes I work with retreats sometimes I run workshops Sometimes, you know, I do things here and there. Sometimes I do corporate. I was once called um, to do some corporate world uh, um, work for the World Bank, which was quite interesting. Hmm. And um, yeah, it's it's been a journey, but it's been a good one. How, how old are you now? I am 41. 41. You've lived, you've lived several lives. So um, yes, yeah, that sounds thankfully. amazing. I'm super excited to get into all of this with you. I mean, obviously, some of it sounds very heavy and, and, and dark. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very interested to hear all about it. Um, it when, when the cameras were off just then, you actually said to me, you wished that you'd said something different from one of your answers. So mm -hmm. we'll, get, we'll get to that. Um, okay. But how did you find the, uh, the questions in the dark? Fun. Yeah. It's a little bit like that very famous interview uh, program that, you know, was around in the beginning of the 2000s um, mm -hmm. uh, where they interviewed uh, famous actors. And I think it was called 20 Questions. Right. Um, and they just like fired away really quickly and they had very witty, um, you know, 
replies and it was just like one word. It was, mm. yeah, a little okay. bit like that. I don't think I've seen that, but I'll look that up. Yeah. Because I'm always interested to see similar things. 20 yeah, cues. Yeah. Let me write that down. Um, so let's let's start with your childhood, if we, if we may. Sure. Because I'm super interested to hear about everything you're doing now, but I always find it really interesting hearing what someone's been through in their life what mm-hmm. kind of a character they were because I, I love I, I always say this um in the episode so far i love the saying that we are all children in adults bodies oh for sure these are the for you'll sure. know more, much more about this stuff yes. than me but these are the um <laughs> these are the things that we're living with as we get older and we're managing mm. and our motivations are born out of it and everything so i'm super interested to hear um, about your childhood so you said your earliest childhood memory was sort of two years old yeah it's... having wet the bed yeah, with diapers. Yeah. It's a very strange one because there's nothing particular about that memory, right. but it is the oldest memory that I can think of. Yeah. Um, and it's very clear in my head. I, I mean, I still see the drips like coming wow. down and it's very strange. Yeah, that is strange. Um, um, but I had, uh, I grew up in Colombia in the 80s. Um, during that time, it was still quite peaceful in a way, and it was, um, you know, there wasn't any problem. I remember when I was super, like, tiny, you know, I I mean, of course, you're not aware of these type of things and you're not watching the news, but I don't remember any, like, war or cartel drugs um, things happening um, when I was very young. It had started happening when I was maybe around 8 or 10. So up until I was 8 or 10, I always probably felt very safe, very happy, um, Grew up with both my parents. One of them is a university professor, mechanical engineer. My mother is a um, school teacher, um, but she studied um, like communication, um, social communication. And my older sister, who's currently a journalist. And um, it was, you know, very, I don't remember anything big or, um, you know, or important that kind of like stands out. But when I started growing up, I remember um, you know, we used to travel a lot by car to see my grandparents at Cali. So I grew up in Bogota, which is a city up in the mountains. Yeah. Um, and we would travel to see my grandparents in Cali, which was maybe an eight hour drive um, or something like that. And there was a point where... Um, I remember always doing these trips with my parents. And when I was maybe around nine or 10, we were already in Cali, but we were going to go to Medellin to see some relatives. And Pablo Escobar fled uh, La Catedral, which was the jail where he was in. And everybody and the war um, with the bombs like started going on. And so we started to become afraid of actually, you know, traveling uh, by car. And then you would start to hear the news and watch the news and all the things that were happening um, that related like the war between the drug cartels and everything like that and bombs going on in different places. And and so that was the first time I remember feeling um, a lack of security, like that I wasn't safe in, um, you know, and as a child, that is very strange. But at the same time, by the time I was 10 or 11, it was so much in the news every day that it had become kind of like normalized. And so you were kind of waiting to see how many people were dead in, mm. you know, so it, in it, the... I don't know much about it. So but that was having a big effect on the civilian population when that was all going on. Well, the war, the war between the cartels, um, I mean, even though they were targeting each other, um, most of the people that ended up dying. I mean, there were certain like bombs that were put specifically to target certain political leaders or certain journalists um, or certain, you know, people that were basically exposing what the drug lords were doing, what their links were with the guerrillas and, the, you know, everybody that kind of wanted to expose them and wanted uh, to clean or, or, you know, wanted to end this basically ended up um, going, um, you know, getting victimized. And then that's when the kidnapping started. Mm. And that went on probably until around 2000 and like one, basically a lot of the, what they called like uh, pescas milagrosas, which means like miraculous um, fishing. Like they would stop or make like, uh, they would stop. uh, I mean, I remember they once even entered a church and then just kidnapped people randomly. Or they would make a halt in the road and they would... 
and they would, you know, just see who was worth kidnapping or not. So, yeah, so how were they, what was the motivation for the kidnapping? Uh, extortion. Right. A way of sustaining their, their, so their... They would, be, they would take people who they thought had wealthy ransom. relatives and then... Yeah, and gosh. asking for ransom. And then there were some people that were also kidnapped, some important people that were kidnapped to pressure the government into not extraditizing um, the, the criminals. Right. So whenever they wanted to take the like the heads of the drug uh, war, of the drug lords um, to the states to be penalized in the states, the states has uh, much more tighter security prisons. And and they also have the death penalty, mm. whereas Colombia doesn't. And so, but and they were technically committing crimes in the states because they are exporting their drugs to Europe and the states. And so, if they face trial outside of Colombia, their sentences are going to be a lot harder. And so, the president at that time, which was Gaviria, wanted. Um, there was a big movement to to. Um, um, extradite them and judge them outside of Colombia. But mm. that, um, and of course, they didn't want that to happen. Yeah. And so they were, you know, it was a lot of manipula uh, manipulation and a lot of um, extortion, you know, basic terrorism. I'm guessing at the time you didn't have such like a, a detailed understanding of no. what was going no, on. No, I was probably around eight or nine years old. Do you remember oh. what your experience of that time was just from your perception as an eight, nine year old? Um, I remember there were elections coming up. And uh, there was this guy that was called Galan, and he was a political favorite. And he got shot, and he was the brother of my sister's eye doctor. Gosh, okay. And um, I remember going with my sister. She had, like, eye therapy or something um, at that time. And I remember going um, with her. Um, to accompany her to her thing with my mom. And I remember this woman and, you know, even everybody just being like with their eyes really like just red and and uh, like, you know, just bloodshot from all the crying and from all the because he was basically shot during his political campaign. And um, yeah. And and then, of course, the you know, then then who was going to preside um, the the country? And do you remember how like that? Just kind of living in that environment made you feel like, were you afraid of being kidnapped? Were you were you aware of that sort of thing? Yeah, 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 of course, yeah. And we also had bomb drills at school. No child should ever grow up with a bomb drill or an evacuation drill happening at school. Yeah, That doesn't, you know, that shouldn't happen too. And so when people consume drugs lightly um, outside and, and they're like, oh, you're from Colombia, you must love cocaine or you must have... I cannot get more offended or more insulted or sure. more hurt um, by these people's comments because they don't understand. You were victims that, of their culture, basically. Yeah. That, yeah, and that basically that this was fueling that war on drugs, that it was the exporting of cocaine, what was actually, um, the, you know, giving the money to all of the, you know, to not only the, the guerrilla uh, groups that happened later, but to all of the drug lords. Mm -hmm. And this is where their fortune was coming from. So right. they were snorting blood blood of a lot of people, but, you know, and, and so these, um, yeah, uh, and, and so I've always had really bad um, connotations when I get associated with that, and it, it infuriates me, and um, and there's just a lot of ignorance around that mm. um, in the world in general. Well, it's it's sort of glamorized in these documentaries and uh, and TV, like, you know, Narcos, I never, yeah. I think I saw a couple of episodes of Narcos yeah. and whatnot, but I think it, it kind of glamorizes it. Exactly. To, to and, and so that that hurt us a lot because we were finally getting rid of the stigma of Pablo Escobar mm. and of, you know, having a Colombian passport is a pain in the butt. Yeah. I have to have a visa to go everywhere, everywhere. I I used to have a visa, need a visa for all of Europe, or I did until up until like maybe four or five years ago. Um, and now it's easier in that sense. But before... It was so expensive and it is still, I mean, Colombia is still the only Latin American country that needs a visa to go into Malaysia. I live right next door to Malaysia. Yeah. I've been living here for I don't know how many years. I still haven't been able. I've been in the KL airport, I don't know how many times on <laughs> transit, but I can never get off and, and, and visit mm -hmm. because the visa is super complicated for Colombian citizens in Malaysia. Why? Because of that. That's crazy. Yeah. Y you said before no child should have to experience that with the bomb drills and, and all that sort yeah. of thing. Um, I, I mean, I, I think about my school experience, you know, for all my complaints, it was very safe. Um, I can't imagine what that would have felt like to feel unsafe in something that's like in the West anyway, we deem to be like kind of like a, it, you, you can, that you can experience bullying, you can experience uh, maybe 
preferential or non-preferential treatment by teachers and things like that, but it's like within the realms of it being a school. How, how does that sort of affect things when there's like such a big external fear like impacting on the culture? Well, I remember that at that time I went to an international school. It was the American school in Colombia. And I remember, and my mom was a teacher at that school. Um, and I remember um, the, the American or the other, the sometimes American, sometimes Canadian uh, teachers that whenever the school, um, like the school principal went to, or the school, yeah, like the people that hire went to interview at these fairs, nobody wanted to go to Colombia. And so it was hard to bring uh, um, like foreign teachers to live in Colombia at that time because it was really unsafe. And so you grow up, you get desensitized to really horrible news, and that's not great. Um, I remember seeing horrendous things like once the gorilla put in a bomb collar to a lady um, to extortion, you know, some sort of um, as an extortion movement. Um, it was an, an, an feeling unsafe was, you know, I remember my father putting big pieces of tape in an X. My house had very big um, windows like that you could see. There were maybe like one meter and a half or two meters by two meters, something like that. And I remember people saying like, you know, there's threats of bombs, open the windows and put big X's um, with tape on the wow. windows just in case it goes down so that the br the glass won't shatter. Yeah. Um, and, you know, these things happen, but you don't really talk about it, not because um, you don't want to, but because there's nothing you can do because that's your reality at that point. And so you kind of learn to live in this helplessness. Mm -hmm. um, what in, I think in psychology, they, they, they call it learned helplessness where, you know, you can't escape that because that's where you live and that's your country and that's your home. Um, and so you kind of try to adapt to navigate. We used to want to go and, and sail. My, my father loved sailing and he founded with some friends uh, a small sailing club um, in a small lake in the outskirts of Bogota. And we couldn't go through the mountains. We had to take the highway because you because we people knew that the gorilla was were outside in a town called Guasca, and that they could any moment do a, a um, like a miraculous fishing thing to see who they kidnapped. Wow. And so it changed a lot of the routes. People stopped traveling by car. People started flying. Um, we had friends um, that, you know, I started getting used to people, you know, just having a lot of bodyguards and a lot of security. Friends' parents got kidnapped. My mom's cousin got kidnapped. Yeah. Um, there was, it was, it was tragic. It was, in, it, it, it impacts you in a way that, you know, actually I, you know, once again, when I, when you leave the country, and I think one of the reasons why I haven't gone back to live is because feeling safe is just such an important part. And every time I'm back home, either even though I love being back home, I never open my windows uh, fully if I'm in a car. Um, I don't walk around with my phone talking ever if I'm in the streets. Um, not because it isn't safe, but because I don't feel safe and because people will, you know, snatch Colombia is still a poor country. We still, you know, it, people struggle for daily things. And so a lot of petty crime still happens. They won't kidnap you anymore, um, but a lot of small theft still happens, and you just don't want to expose yourself to that. Understandably so. Yeah. Um, you said a statement in there that really caught my ear, very powerful when you said living in helplessness. Mm. Um, I'm just trying to think about how like that that would affect you, and and I'm wondering when because you you've your one word to describe childhood, despite all of this, was happy. Up um, until I was eight, yes. I mean, I was happy in the sense that. Um, I have I have a very nice family. I was very very lucky. My sister and I always laugh um, at how happy my parents still are after almost fifty years of being married and together. The norm is that most of our parents' friends have divorced or have broken up or you know there's been a tragedy, and we're always kind of like laughing and waiting to see when is the skeleton in the closet of this family going to come <laughs> out because because everything just seems too nice and too kosher. Like what is going on? And so yeah, that that I think that both my parents and um, and, you know, always kept us kind of like very safe. And with that sense, um, that we always learned from very from a very young age to be very low key 
and to, you know, my parents never wanted to have or show anything luxurious right. because you never want to be a target. And so, you know, when people have, um, you know, flashy cars or, you know, flashy things, I'm like, just like, dude, you don't, you do not know the power of an, an like on an anonymity or, you know, just, yeah. you don't want, you know, you don't call too much attention. Don't, um, you know, in these type of things, don't show your money. Don't, yeah. uh, yeah. Do you think that's affected you in a on like a level of your personality too? For sure. You you, you said that, that you think other people maybe perceive you as quite serious. Maybe. Um, yeah. Would you, would you say that that kind of is overlapping into that a little bit or? Uh, maybe, yeah. maybe. But I think the seriousness comes probably from my father's side and the family. They're all very scientific, very structured, very like, and yeah, so it's okay. uh, <laughs> very engineering yeah. and um, yeah. And so maybe it comes from that. I don't perceive myself at all as someone serious. Mm. Um, but I remember being at school once, like with the secretary's principal or something. And and she told me, like, you and your sister are so serious. And I was like, what? We're serious? I mean, by sister, maybe I could um, understand more because she's very intellectual, very smart, very, you know, she was always national junior honor society, national honor society, straight A is you know she was that girl um i couldn't count to save my life but um yeah but i could fix a car or a, or a washing machine or an engine so you know it, you know either or sure, it's, sure yeah yeah got the practical skills. yes um so i'd lo i'd love to hear how you progress out of this phase in your life um you don't live in colombia anymore obviously yes. um and, and you've done and you've done so much so i'd love to move the story forward and and here, um, so you, you go from, from a child in Colombia, you do school there. Yeah. And how do you how do you move forward? What happens? So uh, when I'm 14, my parents want us to go and live in Europe for a year as right. an exchange. And so my father and his friend um, do like an exchange um, program. Mm -hmm. And um, they my father goes and teaches in the University of Reading. So I think mm. my father and John Burton met in Southampton University when they were doing their PhD. And so they exchange or in, I, I'm not sure, I'm not quite sure about the ins and outs, but they may, they become friends. Uh, John Burton at some point moves to Colombia and now they teach together. And then John marries this Colombian woman, John and his wife, um, go to the UK. And then my parents want to, you know, kind of swap lives for a bit. And so we do, we go in 2000, no, 1997, 1996, we moved to the UK to a very, very small town called Tadley, um, between Basingstoke and Reading and my, because there are houses there. And this is a really, really small town that sure. back in the day, it doesn't show up at the map because the <laughs> AWE, which was the atomic weapon establishment at that time, um, it was part of a target. It was one of the targets when the Gulf War was happening. Oh. So the AWE, nobody knows about it. Um, okay. And so this is why I say that it's like living with the Simpsons because, you know, your friends would come home glowing or like their parents, you, you know, you would say because of the radiation or anything like that. And it was always a joke. It was a very small town. Um, I was very used to the private school um, institution in Colombia. Everybody, you know coming from a socioeconomic background and getting put in public school in Tadley was actually a very enlightening experience because then I was, you know, going to school with kids from all different backgrounds, from all different walks of life. And uh, Colombia is a very classist society and it was just so refreshing to see this, you know, kind of thing where, you know, you don't measure people up because of the amount of education or money that they have. Everybody is the same. Everybody has the same equalities, same opportunities. And so that was really nice to see. And... Um, my parents also wanted us to not always, we always had a cleaner, having help in Colombia is very affordable, like it's mm. here in Bali. And, uh, you know, they, they wanted us to be kind of more responsible and more exposed to, you know, doing our own things. Um, and so my mom didn't work for a year. She was gardening. She was cooking. She was, you know, just being a housewife, which was nothing, something that she had probably never experienced. And my father was out in the university working. And so we traveled a lot and that was really nice. And we were traveling every time we had holidays. We were going to different parts of Europe or to Egypt or to Greece or to Turkey or, you know, it was just really, really nice. And I think that I got kind of like that vein and that desire to travel and see the world um, from my parents. Yeah. And so we came back to Colombia and then I 
graduated school and I wanted to study fine arts. And I remember um, right before I, a couple of friends and girls from school had found this program uh, to go on ex like a, an, an exchange kind of gap year thing to France to learn French as a second language. And it was very affordable. So I told my mom about it. And they were like, okay, sure, you know, it's super affordable. We can we can do this for you. And so I went to live on my own um, to France, to Nantes for a year. That's amazing. So I just wanted to quickly ask you about that that earlier year and then this decision you've made. It's like, was the the feeling of being able to travel and, and have your life like that quite, quite? I mean, it is for everyone, but quite empowering experience, I'd imagine, because yes. you talk about living in like accepting the helplessness and then going from that to, wow, like, This is living. I mean, it's kind just of kind of wanting world. to eat the world. Mm. You know, you you just you you I want to like for me it's just about I learned I think so much. I think I've learned more during that year living on my own in France than I ever did in the four years of uni that followed after. Because right. the four years of uni didn't teach me how to have a budget. I was still in Colombia. When you go to uni, most of the time, unless you go to uni in a different uh, place, you stay home with your parents while you're going to uni. So it was a lot more responsible and there was a lot more to be learned and to be experienced in France, having a budget, learning how to use public transportation, having a map, uh, another language, starting starting to work to earn more pocket money so that I could travel to more places, mm -hmm. um, starting to save, you know, just it was, even though, you know, it was, I learned basic French and I could, you know, still, you know, hear a lot of conversations, a lot of my vocabulary has been forgotten. I think I learned more about life mm -hmm. um, than I learned about, um, you know, other things that are not really as important like trigonometry. What, um, what so. would be your what would be your big big life learning takeaway from that experience? Do you think? Uh, independence, being mm. independent, you know, understanding that that you can be that that you need to you need to rely on yourself, and therefore you need to be good to yourself because nobody's going to do the laundry for you, nobody's going to do the budgeting for you, nobody's going to do the work for you. Yeah, you have to do the work yourself. Yeah, I've 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 done some therapy myself, and. Um, I remember one time when I was going for a little bit, a little bit of a difficult moment, and my uh, my therapist said to me, "Don't um, don't trust how you feel. Trust your routine, in terms of how you sort of proceed the the days that are coming." And uh, I thought I always found, always found that quite helpful advice, you know, because sometimes you get yourself into a bad headspace, you question things, but if you have a good routine and you trust that routine, eventually, you know. Well, it takes some time to bake a habit, right? Yes. And so when you fall into a good habit, um, it's it's uh, the brain likes habits. Mm. We all function better in habits. And so we need to be very aware of what type of habits we want to cultivate. Do we want to cultivate good habits or bad habits? And then it just, those brain connections get formed and then it's just easier to go on that repeat mode. And so, you know, it's even, uh, and that goes for, for anything, for any behavior. Um, I use it a lot for self-talk when people don't talk to themselves kindly when people are evil it's like wait no stop stop rephrase that yeah. and say it again and repeat it and write it in your bathroom mirror and write it in the exit of your door and write it in the and so that your brain starts to hear it yes. and it starts to like it and then you can start to believe it yeah my mom's actually a cognitive behavioral therapist and that's, okay. that's the modality that i did as well and it's yeah it sounds too easy that's the funny thing about it it sounds It almost sounds too straightforward just mm -hmm. to tell yourself a nice thing and you'll literally change the way you think mm. and to create that that uh, that habitual good I mean there's for... this uh, there's this movie that came out in the what year was that early 2000s Joe Dispenza was interviewed in that movie and it was called What the Bleep Do We Know and the main takeaway of that movie was that um words and thoughts Um, can affect the nerve, the 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 cellular component of of a being, wow. and uh, when you talk nice words and when you you know give nice words to other people, you can really affect them up to their cell. And when you talk bad words to other people or when you insult other people, you can also really affect them down to their cell. And there's this. Um, 
Japanese artist um, called Masaru Emoto, and he makes he makes this experiment with water um, in petri dishes with distilled water, and he freezes it. And when the water is frozen in this petri dish, uh, when he goes into the microscope, it looks it's just a hexagon. When he blesses or asks the monks to bless the water, or he writes a beautiful prayer um, for the water, or a nice word like love or connection or happiness, the waters form these beautiful crystals like snowflakes and when he insults them the water it's like it's just a mess and nothing gets formed wow. and we are 70 percent water so imagine what can nice words do to us and what they can also like what not nice words can do to us yeah that's fascinating so um i want to push forward into into what you do into what you experience mm -hmm. and, uh, i'm so fascinated by what you do um the impact of what you do you said is, is generate change so can you take me on that journey to, to being a change generator? Please? Okay, so, um, wow. So I, after I started, you know, after I went off to uni in, um, I came back home and I, you know, got my undergrad in, um, in fine arts and did a little bit of work in some, MG, in some NGOs. And then I started to look into a master's degree and I found art therapy and I thought, wow, you know, this is awesome. When I was doing my thesis project um, from from fine arts, um, I did it on how people carry their identity on their skin. And it was kind of like a, um, like a preoccupation that, especially in Colombia and Latin America, plastic surgery was very much like the movie or like the series Nip Tuck, where you go into the seamstress. Oh, can you, you know, just put down, like bring down the seam a little bit the same way of can you please enlarge my boobs a little bit more or put. Uh, you know, or take out this piece of fat. And so, you know, our bodies kind of became a dress um, in, a, in a way. And so I did dresses out of skin um, for my thesis. And so I was, right. you know, painting. Uh, I did like um, cast... I did uh, molds of my mom and some friends' bodies out of cast, and then I painted them with latex, and I peeled that latex off, and I embroidered and sewed uh, them together to make, like, this clothes collection. Wow. And so it was very gruesome, but very say, impactful. It sounds quite creepy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, um, and, and I had to read a lot about psychology, um, and I found myself fascinated with psychology. And then this other girl that was presenting her thesis at the same time that I was told me about art therapy and I was like oh this sounds like something I want to explore yeah. and so I did and I started my master's degree in Barcelona but the school that I attended I was not happy with it was a little bit I felt like I was going to a university garage I don't want to say their names because I don't want to shame them mm -hmm. but um, I transferred then to New York and I trained in New York and then I moved back to Colombia briefly and started working as a kindergarten teacher absolutely Detested it. Really? Detested it. What did you detest about it? Working with two and three year olds. Yeah. It's just exhausting. Yeah. Exhausting. Exhausting. I had worked with them in a hospital where they have limited movements because they have, you know, they have a lot of, unfortunately, a lot of like things hooked up to them. So they can't really leave a bed or be very active or. And this was just really, uh, yeah, just nerve wracking. And so at that time, I had a partner that um, lived in Vietnam. And when he came to visit me to Colombia, he wanted maybe to live, live or move to Latin America. And when he came to Colombia, they mugged us. Wow. And they mugged us terribly. And I was terrified. And I thought, oh, OK, maybe, maybe. Maybe it's time to go again. Maybe I don't want to stay here. And so he offered, why don't you come here instead? And I did. And it was a great thing because he was a great ship that took me over to the other side of the world, literally. And then I got another job as a kindergarten teacher. And again, I hated it. <laughs> Didn't <laughs> was, from the first one. <laughs> and I wasn't a bad teacher. There was a lot more structure into this school and everything. But very quickly, my boss at that time realized that I wasn't happy there. And so... Um, I had a bike accident. Then I got kicked out of my job as a kindergarten teacher because uh, I wasn't interested in doctrinizing kids. They're like, no, the kids need to eat like this and they have to do this. And I'm like, no, I need to understand why they are behaving this way. Mm -hmm. So my psychology part, my art therapist part was coming in and I was not letting that um, 
show up because the, the the school director, they're like, no, they have to be ready for school. And so you have to teach them this and you have to. I wasn't interested in why the kid, you know, in, in making the kid do things that he didn't want to do. I wanted to understand why he didn't want to do them, mm. why it was so difficult for him not to mm. do them or to do them. So um, that's, that's a very, very interesting point. And um, it's it shows that uh, you, you sort of have that appreciation for the, the nuance of the individual. I mean, I think that's one thing people often complain about with, with schools is that, you know, the, they often don't suit people. Yeah. Um, yeah. I definitely felt like the way I was educated didn't suit me at all. Mm. Um, I definitely felt quite stupid at school a lot of the time. Right. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, that's just really interesting that you that you felt that way. Yeah. And so she did me the best favor that anyone has ever done to me and she fired me. Right. Um, and so I was <laughs> devastated at the time because, uh, uh, yeah, because also six months before that, my boyfriend, whom uh, I moved to Vietnam for, breaks up with me. Right. And then I fell off my scooter and <sighs> then I get kicked out of work. And I'm like, dude, what is like, OK, bad things come in three enough. This is the third one. What am I going to do here? Yeah. Um, thankfully, Life sent me a great friend um, and um, I moved in with her and we, you know, she was actually one of the teachers in this place. And um, and so she was great company and family at that time. And so I got over these three things and I got the courage um, to open my art therapy, um, my private practice. Amazing. And uh, and it just started flowing and, you know, people started coming in. I just did some flyers and I posted them in some places where the expat community lived and that's how it started and then these two women that uh, worked they were they loved art and they had been into the Pacific Links Foundation up in Sapa visiting um, out of their own kind of interest they brought in just like some papers and markers and things for the girls to draw and like big things of paper and they're like wow you know these girls really take it into drawing and into and even though the communication gap was really big like they saw art as a very big potential in healing um these girls and so they met me or somebody told them about you know this art therapist and they're like that's it we're going to sponsor you to go to Sapa and to go and work with these girls once a month and to do workshops. And I was like, guys, I don't speak a word of Vietnamese. Vietnamese is impossible. And they're like, it's okay. They're going to provide a translator. And um, and so then I was way able to like work with them. Um, I would go up there uh, during like for two years. I went up there like once a month and did these workshops with them. And it was amazing. Yeah. I'd, I'd love to know more about what art therapy is. So art therapy, I, the way I always describe it is it's like going to the psychologist, but you don't only talk. You also draw, you paint, you make sculptures, and um, you work with more the right hemisphere of the brain. Our left hemisphere is very analytical, and it's very mathematical, and uh, when we're talking, we're using the left hemisphere. So we're very careful with our words. And so when we are communicating things to our therapist um, using the left hemisphere. It's really easy to lie to ourselves. But if I tell you, draw me a picture of a person and you draw a picture of a little boy and you forget to do a mouth and I point it out, well, you know, Harry, what is it like to feel that you can't speak? Why is it hard to communicate? Or, and we start talking about what the mouth means wow. and, and what is communication and what. And so art therapy communicates a lot um, and and it and it always bites you in the butt. Even though I was training as an art therapy in New York, whenever we had to do the homework um, of drawing, I always tried to portray everything beautiful, everything, you know. And then it came and bit me in the butt, and it showed me what I needed to see. Right. And uh, and it was like, stop lying to yourself. Wow. This is this is what you're dealing with. This is what's going on. Mm. Stop trying, you know, take off those rose-colored glasses. You need to address these issues. You can't continue, you know, uh, denying them. That's fascinating. And, and it is unbelievably easy to lie to yourself yes, as well. Yes, yes, yes. Um, and so people come to therapy. Oh, they're all like, no, I don't need therapy. I'm like, people just go to therapy to know themselves, mm. to learn to accept themselves, and then to see 
what they like about themselves and just leave it that way and learn, learn to accept it? Or what do they want to change mm -hmm. about themselves? Because if the same things that they have been doing for the last five years or 10 years is not working, then maybe they need a change. Yeah, and that's the, and change is often the scariest thing. Um, that's that's fascinating though because I, I can certainly think of people I know and um, myself even at times you know where you you approach therapy and you want to get something out of it, but you think you do, but actually you may be looking in the wrong place or you're lying to yourself about certain things working for you and whatnot. I mean, how do you deal with that process of somebody having a realization about themselves that maybe the, it's like kind of world shattering? So there is, I mean, I think that the main mistake people do when they go to therapy is that they go to therapy because they're obliged, not because they really feel that they need it. And so they go and they lie to the therapist. Mm. Thing is, it's easier to lie to a talking therapist than it is to an art therapist. Mm. Because when things come up through drawings, then you show them and you reflect them back to the client. And so it takes, and they come out a lot more quicker. The subconscious comes out a lot more quicker with another therapist. It's, you know, it takes more time. It takes more rapport. It makes more of building a relationship until the therapist, you know, is able to really see if the other person, you know, is actually lying to themselves. And then it's hard to show that, to show that reflection back to your client and be like, dude, you're lying to yourself. Like, what are you doing? Seriously. Mm -hmm. And uh, when people come to that realization, I, you know, I always tell them, well, you have two options. You can either learn to love yourself the way you are, or if you really don't like that about yourself, then what can you do to change it? So what other options do we have? Let's explore that. How would this or this feel instead of doing that? You know, if your response to, I don't know, anger is normally you know, grabbing something and throwing it to the floor and breaking it, why don't you just carry a big stack of paper around? And whenever you get super angry, you know, you just rip up some paper. And so that's a little bit more tolerable. And yes, you are still, you know, doing that, but it's safer. There's no glass around. You're not hurting anyone. And so, you know, it's about also giving them options. And then little by little, we can start generating change. Yeah. It's not about denying the emotion. It's not about getting rid of the emotion. We're not there yet to be in that super Zen yogi space where it's like embrace your emotions and just observe them. No, some people have really, really intense emotions that they need to be able to express. But it's how do we express them in a safe way? Yeah, and it, is it that fear of facing a person's own emotions you think that stops people from from sort of making change? Because, you know, there's lots of people that aren't happy. And I suppose, what, what would you say is the main challenge to change? Is it is it uh, the sort of attachment we have to our identities? Is it, what, what, how, do you, how do you perceive that? Because I know that's, you look at society today and there's so many people that are struggling, but maybe aren't doing anything about it. Well, know? I think that society and the way it's set up doesn't really help because we are all put into these places and we're expected to go into these factories, offices, um, call it whatever you want, and sit in a work in a desk and crunch numbers or write paragraphs or analyze data from uh, nine to six. So that's half of your life already, you know, sitting in a desk. And unless you're really in love with what you do and you have a really great company, a lot of people just don't want to do that. And so the pandemic brought out like all of this reality that people don't want to be stuck in a desk anymore. People want to have a more, um, a different experience of a life. People want to work in different things. People want to connect more with other people. They want to connect more with nature. And so, you know, Letting people, not letting people, because everybody, I mean, there are people that thrive in these environments and there's room for everything in this world. But, you know, allowing yourself to understand that maybe this and what society uh, like kind of built up for you is not really what you wanted. Allowing yourself to enter those questions to come in, um, you know, that is... that is something that that people actually, you know, fear a lot. You are, you know, you are taught when you are a little girl or when you're a little boy, you go to school, you go to uni, you get a job, you get married, you form a family, then you get grandkids, and then you die. And that is a happy life for you. Man, 
people don't really need to do that to have a happy life. It can go in many other different directions. People are nowadays, especially our generations, are now starting to question, do I really want to have kids? Will this actually make me happy? Um, and 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 it's, yeah, and so it's, I think it's allowing yourself to ask the questions that you really need to ask yourself. Mm. What do I want? It's that focus on the individual, like you said before, yeah. when you're looking at those young kids. Yeah. What makes me happy? What works for me? You know, what works for me will maybe not work for the person next door, but that's okay. We have different paths in lives. What, you know, and, and, and we have different, everyone's recipe for happiness is different. Yeah. Just, you know, you have to find your own. What are the ingredients that are based for yours? I, I wanted to ask you more about, um, you were talking before about creating that safe space for people to deal with, you know, their emotions. Mm. I think like I, something, it was something I really struggled with for a long time mm -hmm. that I'm now able to do a little better is, is understand myself and the emotions I experience. I think um, definitely growing up, I, I would pretend I was fine all the time. But I, it wasn't just like... You're British. I am British. I also went to boarding school. <laughs> it all, it yeah. goes into your, <laughs> into <male>. your DNA. <laughs> I'm a British male that went to a, went to a boarding school. Yes. You, can't, you can't show emotion at boarding school. Yes, yes. Um, so I went through most of my life. So, you know, it's only in the last couple of years I've really developed this ability. It's sort of... Um, because, sort of, you know, they always talk about men not talking. But it's actually more, it was more than that for me. It was not even talking to myself, like not even letting myself acknowledge how I was feeling. So mm. I actually have an autoimmune condition now. Yeah. And I'm absolutely convinced I developed it because of like the amount of anxiety I was experiencing. You know, Perhaps, yeah. I feel like everything used to go to my stomach. Mm -hmm. And when I felt like scared or sad or confused, or whatever, it would go to my stomach. Yeah. I mean, this um, is where the Greeks thought that we had our heart. We're very visceral in right. our emotions. Right. Well, they talk about the gut, uh, brain mm -hmm. axis and all this stuff yes. now. It's super interesting. Yes. But just, I've just wanted to ask you though, um, for people that have been through difficult things in life, that mm -hmm. have, have a lot of complex emotions and things they can't really face, how do, how do you through art therapy create that safe environment, that safe space? So one of the most, for example, to go to exercises um, that, that we did was paint your emotions. Yes, tell me next, this is, this is interesting actually, tell me next. You know, what would, what would, you know, if I told you, and, and, and let's, let's paint um, imaginatively so that the audience can understand. Okay. If I tell you, tell me one of, one of the emotions that you would like to paint. Why don't you mm. pick it? One of the ones that is more difficult for you to accept and understand. Mm. Fear. Fear, okay. Yeah. I want you to close your eyes. Okay. Okay, I want you to think about fear and embody fear. What colors come up? Mm, red. Okay. Is it big or is it small? Big. Okay, are there any other colors? Mm, like yellow. Okay. Does it have any specific shape or texture? Yeah, it's like... It's like a demon looking thing with like wavy lines to define the body shape. And okay. Yeah. Okay. Is it easier to tolerate fear if you see it like that? If you see it on a paper, if you are able to draw it like that? If I can, do you mean if it, if, if I... you were able right now, like to mm. draw it? Mm. Yeah, sure. It's just a picture. Yeah. Can you comprehend it now more? Yeah. So what happens when you start seeing your feelings and start understanding your emotions as shapes and as colors? Mm. Are they more tolerable? Mm. Yeah, they are. Because mm. it's like a it's like a tangible thing. It's like that's confusing. You're looking at it and you're like, that's the thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so you are able to recognize it. Okay, that's fear. Mm. Now, if I ask you where in your body does fear sit, where would you point at? Yeah. Your belly. Yeah. yeah. Like kind of like that. Yeah, and that, that solar the knot, plexus. That bit where the knot goes, you know. Yes, where you feel that pit in your stomach, where yeah. that anxiety builds up, where there's that fire. Yeah. Yeah. And I can bet you that there's probably hundreds of people that are, when listening to this podcast, will say, yeah, I identify with Harry's fear. Yeah. But once you talk about it, once you bring it out, once you give it a shape, a color, and it's easier to tolerate. Yeah. Then you're like, okay, okay, so fear is not bigger than me. I have the fear. The fear doesn't have me. Mm. And this is something that I always tell my clients. You have the emotion. The emotion doesn't have you. Mm. It's, it's hard. It's actually, it's much harder to find the words to describe 
Mm -hmm. That, because it it seems, like you just said, it does seem like a big thing because it's like what caught your... your what causes fear comes from so many different, well, in my life anyway, it comes from a lot of yeah, different places. for sure. So to just kind of be like, well, that's the thing there in one one space is kind mm -hmm. of more, it does it does feel more manageable. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's really nice. I, I want to know, so you, you're in Vietnam, you've started practicing as an art therapist. Mm -hmm. So where does this journey now take you? Because you've worked with some people that have been through a lot of things. Yes. Um, I'd love to hear more about that and uh, your experiences with, with all that. So I start working with the girls in the Pacific Links Foundation in Sapa. Um, and I start going up there with Mimi, um, who is um, um, a girl that owns the founder of this um, place. Um, and she starts telling me, because I don't speak the language and she's Vietnamese American, she kind of works as my translator, but also um, helps me understand because she knows her life histories and what these girls have been through. Mm -hmm. And so um, she also helps me understand also where they are living. And these are girls that are living in the northern tribes of Vietnam. So they are coming from the Red Sao, the Sao, the Hmong, the Flower Hmong, all of these communities that kind of interchange between China and northern Vietnam. Um, and they a lot of these girls, these are people that, you know, they're beautiful, beautiful girls that, you know, just lead very simple lives. They work the fields. Many of them are not scholarized. Um, they work in the countryside. They become to their, you know, they, they, they probably, gr most of them grew things and then they brought them into the markets to sell. And uh, when social media comes in, they start meeting these boys on Instagram or on Facebook. And, and so they meet these boys for coffee. Coffee. And then the boys put something in their coffee and when they wake up, they are already in China and they are either being sold um, to a, you know, a human trafficking trade organization that is going to then take them to other parts of the world and oh use them God. and sell them as prostitutes or uh, they are being sold also as wives. And so their traffickers uh, brand them and uh, torture them and uh, they go through horrendous experiences or they get sold into, you know, a, a family that they didn't want to make. And um, and so they have really traumatizing experience. But all of these girls is, have a lot of resilience and are very smart because they get put in a place where they do not speak the language and they are caged. And even so, they manage to escape and they find their way back into Vietnam. And so the border control in Lao Cai has been trained by this NGO to recognize the girls because there's a lot of shame into being not, you know, of not being a virgin anymore and coming back into your tribe because you're not good anymore. I mean, you're not, you're, you're, you've been used kind of. And so it's a shame for the tribe to take them back. And so these girls have nowhere to go. And um, the NGO recognizes, uh, trains the, the security guards to recognize them. The security guards ask them the amount of questions that they need to ask without it being, uh, um, let's say, uh, not offensive. Yeah. You know, they ask it in a very delicate way so that they can actually admit that, yes, that they were victims of the of the, um, sexual trafficking. And then they, the first step that they take is giving them like a package to like humanize themselves. So they give them a fresh, clean package of clothes, toothbrush, uh, shampoo, soap. They provide a shower and then they call somebody from the NGO that can go and pick them up and that they can explain to them. They can call their parents back. And, you know, they can tell your parents, your daughter is back. We have found out what has happened. What do you guys want to do? Do you want to take her? You know, what do you want to do? They also ask the girls. These are girls that are between 12 and 16 years old, mainly. Um, and, you know, do you want to go back to your family or do you want to stay here in the shelter home and we'll provide education and we'll provide a sleeping room for you and you will meet the other girls. And so sometimes most of them rather stay in the shelter because they have other girls that understand what they have been through. They have education. They have uh, an opportunity then to change their lives and to get better into that. And so I go in there basically to work a lot through drawings and through expression and through embodiment. And the first exercise that we did um, was that we created, um, they, we did like a guided meditation and they met a guardian 
in their guided meditation. And then I brought a lot of felt and embroidered um, and, 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 and a lot of like things to sew. And they made like these stuffed animals with their guardians. And then we did like this huge canopy that they painted with what was their safe space so that we could create a place where they could be safe. And it was really beautiful because their report after they did like their safe space exercise with their guardian um, and they drew and they painted all this, all of them reported that their nightmares had decreased uh, tremendously. And they, you know, they said, you know, I finally feel like I'm sleeping well. And so it was really moving and really touching to see the power of, you know, of art and the togetherness and the, you know, just how resilient and also how, how much they want to overcome this past that they have so that they can have a better future. And, 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 and uh, sorry, it's, so it's a lot to mm. process because like your, your instant reaction is anger. Like when you hear stuff like that, it's, yeah. it's very difficult. Um, to hear it, let alone experience it, um, and yeah, it's 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 ama it's amazing what you're doing. It's fantastic, and the fact that they were able to you know improve their mental health a little bit on the back of that is incredible. But it's just twelve to sixteen year olds. It's like yeah, they're you, very young. You they're girls. You can't fathom it. It's no. um, it's horrendous. No, it's criminal. It's criminal, and 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 there's so much going on that we don't know about, and it's so horrible. Mm. Um, to learn, you know, what human trafficking is and how much of it goes on and nobody... Well, how, yeah, I wanted to ask you, how much of it does go on in that region? A, a lot, yeah. because there is a... One of the reasons why there is a lot of human trafficking is because um, China has a very small male population, sorry, a very big male population and a smaller female population from these generations, from right. the one-child policy right. and people always wanting to have a male because in Chinese culture and in Chinese tradition, or like in many other Asian or Muslim countries, having the boy is the important part. The girl they can dispose of, right. but not the boy. Yeah, it's awful. Um, and, and just, and just, ref I just want to reflect on what you just said about the the desire they have to change. Mm -hmm. we were, what we were talking about before, we were talking about you know the the bravery that's required to address your own emotions and your own feelings and things. And they're only young. Um, it's quite incredible um, yeah. that they have this this will, this desire to to move their lives forward. Yeah, and and one of them is actually, I think, now going to medicine school. Oh, that's incredible. Yeah, it's incredible. It must, really is. You must feel a great sense of pride. Yes, there is, there is. Um, I mean, I think that there are so many good people out there. You know, as uh, there's, there is, it's, it's a little bit kind of like what Bali has to offer. There's the potential for good, and then there's also the potential for bad. And even though, there are a lot of bad people out there. There also are a lot of really good people out there that are, you know, creating all of these changes and wanting these things to happen. And the founder of this NGO um, and the amount of work and impact that she manages to get and create is 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 is, is incredible. Wow. She was a you know a boat child herself, escaping from Vietnam in the Vietnam War. Goes to the states, goes through Harvard University, pays herself through school. Um, you know, she's just one of these women that you're like, wow. This is this is amazing. So that I mean, yeah, that, that's that's incredible. And I, I want I'd love to know more about. So you you did this in Vietnam, and then I think you said you did a few other things with the art therapy. So how did you progress from that work? Um, so that I was doing that at the same time, but this was kind of like one weekend a month um, that I was going up there because it's in Lao Cai and I was living mm. in Ho Chi Minh City. Mm. And in the meantime, I was also working um, with um, the expat population mainly and a few local um you know people from the vietnamese community with um you know just regular art therapy a lot of the international schools um you know reached out you know we have this going on can you come in and help us um or you know what's what's going on so i remember there was uh, ishmik the international school of ho chi minh city their pyp coordinator um primary uh, years coordinator told me you know we have two classes one is very controlling um and 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 there's like two groups of kids one of them are very controlling and the other is you know they're just kind of followers and and we need to kind of understand what's going on here and so i organized these two kind of like group painting activities, um, one in which I gave them markers so that they could experience a lot of control um, in what they were doing and they created this huge mandala. And then another one. What's a mandala? 
a mandala. Mandala. A mandala, like a big round table covered in paper. And so right. they, they paint whatever they want. And then another one with wet paint, I'm sorry, with wet paper and watercolors. Mm. And so what happens when you have wet paint, I mean, wet paper and watercolors is that the paint goes everywhere. And so it was getting both groups of kids to experience control and lack of control and what was more soothing and what was easier and what brought up when they felt like they lost control. For example, when they put a little dab of blue and it just went like, like it just expands everywhere on the paper. And so that gave them the opportunity to reflect about what is controlling and what do they like to control and how do they feel when somebody else controls them. And so that opened up that conversation for them to have. And so, you know, it's just using materials to help other people experience things and communicate other things in other ways. So, you know, that was just an example of another of the things that I did in Vietnam. Yeah, it, it's, a, it's a really interesting thought. You know, um, I think I was talking about this with someone the other day. When we're, when we're kids, when we're in school, you know, there's the curriculum, there's the standard stuff, but we're not really taught about our emotions and we're not really taught about how to understand ourselves. And, right. Um, I mean, I think his response was like, rather than to do a tax return. But, uh, <laughs> but you know, <laughs> but the point is, there's a lot of skills that you need when you get older that you just don't learn when you're in school. Yeah, um, yeah. And I was also curious. I think you, people, yeah. Yeah, I think schools or the school system relies on parents to do that, but mm. parents didn't get taught well, that exactly. either. So, Who, you know, it, you it's know? like, uh, you know, there, there, there's a lot of, every parent does as good as they can with the tools that they get, but there are some parents that just didn't get any tools. Yeah. And so, or and, and they passed on a lot of their unresolved issues to their kids and so how do we deal with that mm, mm. it's like a it's like a never-ending cycle isn't it someone's got to make the decision to go and find it for themselves so they can somebody needs on. to go to therapy and so when a, <laughs> a, ch a parent brings me a child to therapy and they're like fix him i'm like i'm sorry but your child doesn't need fixing we need to work on what your child is provoking in school that he's probably reflecting from something that's going in at home so i will only see your child if you're willing to come to therapy yourself. Uh, okay. Because the change needs to happen to the system. It's the whole system that gets affected. It's not just the child. Yeah. I, I, want, I wanted to ask if you could reflect on, you know, I'm sure you have great experience of this now, but the difference between working with the local girls um, who were, you know, experiencing the trafficking, all that sort of thing. And then you said you were also working with expats at the same time. Mm -hmm. That must have been a really interesting experience to have, like, I, I don't know what the contrast would be like and how you'd approach the two different situations. Yes and no. I mean, there was a lot of, um, I mean, we all have life happen to us. We all have problems. Fear is fear. Anxiety is anxiety. Trauma is trauma. What caused that is what changes. How this trauma came along, what provoked that fear came along, that, that is the different part. And of course, that creates some level of, 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 of trauma or of anxiety. And then there's the other experience that does it very differently. But for example, um, this book um, by Vessel van der Kolk, The Body Keeps the Score, he puts book, yeah. um, in the first episode, there is this, uh, in the first chapter, there is this um, scene of these two people being in a car accident. They were, you know, the same thing happened to them. They both witnessed the same thing. One of them, central nervous system got completely wrecked and she's completely traumatized. The other person is fine. And so, you know, it's not, it's not about, you know, the experience can be different, but also the way of the body tolerating and coping with it and processing. Yeah, I mean, is, it can be different. It's a phrase I've heard a lot. It's not <clears throat> the event, it's how we perceive it. Exactly. Um, it's fascinating. And also something I heard a lot growing up was, um, you know, there's, it's, it's kind of like, I don't know how helpful of a phrase is. I think about it sometimes. It's like people often say, oh, you know, whatever you're experiencing, there's always someone worse off, you know, so, you know, try and be grateful for what you have. But mm. at the same time, yes, yeah, someone else might have gone through like an objectively much worse experience, but it's, but, you know, the but they had more tools to, F yeah, yeah, and also to manage the, it. And also the experience is sort of relative to the individual. So like I might go through something that's objectively not as bad, but I've not. Yeah. I'm, it's, it was bad in the context of my life. Yeah. So the anxiety that you, resulting anxiety is, you know, pretty bad. Exactly. <laughs> and, but I feel like there's a lot of um, kind of, 
guilt out there and shaming a little bit if someone's not really been through something so maybe we put it on ourselves but the, the, you there know, is that i do feel that 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 you know that there is that shame of having something that wasn't really bad but feeling very shaken up afterwards yeah. that that constant oh get over it um kind of attitude that is not really helpful because that person doesn't live in that person's skin and bones they don't have that central nervous system we also don't know what is uh, you know what brain connections are done um in this person's brain we don't know what early childhood experiences you know formed him and his personality or her and so it's very easy to go out there and judge um i think that just people need to go there and try and be less judgmental and more understanding and more accepting mm -hmm. of others and and their emotions a lot of the times when people dismiss or when people um negate others emotions it's because it brings up in them a lot of stuff that they don't want to tolerate and so they're like okay brush over it yeah it happens a lot to parents yeah oh get over it stop crying it's who do you think is harder for um for a child to cry if a child falls down and starts crying because it's very painful for him but the mother is helpless to help and take away his pain for who is it more difficult probably the mother yes. in many ways yeah many times yeah. it's for the mother but the mother cannot tolerate not being able to take away that pain from her child and so she gets angry stop i can't fix this don't do it but she never goes into that train of thought there's never awareness of this you just go there because it creates this intolerance and what have we been taught and what is our defense mechanism reject mm -hmm. put away yeah that's all very interesting um something that you sort of talked about there you know different experiences different people that it all, it all speaks to this thing of trying to understand each other and um how do we understand each other and mm. you know how do we tolerate one another um i wanted to touch on romantic relationships a little bit mm -hmm. um you said that they're very important to you sort of sweet or bitter mm -hmm. um and you mentioned when you went to vietnam that was that was to move away to to be with somebody mm -hmm. um so i'm i'm curious to explore that a little bit if you're if you're up for that um um yeah i mean i think romance is kind of like uh, it's it's it could be we could call it like the deserve of the dessert of life yeah um it's sweet it's it's it can be sometimes too much it can sometimes be too sweet it can sometimes go wrong um but i think that we just you know it's it's an experience um it not always stays the same people have a lot of confusion about what love is and and being in love versus cultivating love and i think that those are two very different things mm -hmm. people i think that they're the chemical rush that way that we feel um that makes us idealize and see blindly like through all the red flags <laughs> of the other person if that didn't exist there wouldn't be people in the world there wouldn't be children in the world because i think that we need kind of that you know blindly and crazy in love feeling to idealize that person initially to be able to then want to take the time to get to know them better right. but then once you fall out of love one of that once that chemistry wears off you know then that's when we get to decide do i really want to cultivate this relationship with this person do mm. i really you know want to give this a chance and give love a chance or or is the curve of his ear really annoying and i just can't stand it and i'm just going <laughs> to go been, away he's yeah been and uh, experience that. <laughs> <laughs> you know i always would tell my friends when the curve of the ear is bothering you it's just time to let go time i mean when the smallest things are just getting on your nerves just let it go yeah yeah Elsa mm -hmm. philosophy go for frozen let it go <laughs> well yeah, let it go well um it's it's fascinating because i feel like a lot of the things we're talking about you know when you talk about like addressing difficult emotions you know not understanding yourself fully or ignoring them i feel like nothing shines a light on those things more than when you're in a romantic relationship with somebody mm -hmm. else and it's a time that can be I feel like when you so you could be someone's friend and it doesn't you don't engage them in the same way you don't you don't trigger the same things in someone almost because it's 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 like that being in a relationship's like that validating experience of like it's a confirmation of 
of sort of who you are and, and the, the ability to connect on that level with someone. So um, if we go into the very, very psychological root based origin, technically, or what the I mean, this is kind of like the theory of why we go into a romantic relationship. Um, which is the first person that you ever loved in the world? I suppose to be my parents. Your mom. Yeah. And so we go technically, supposedly, to replicate that kind of embeddedness and that reconnection and that love story with your parents and to fix and repair that relationship yeah. with your future partner. This is a little bit Freudian. This yeah. is a little bit old school. This is a little bit... But when you think about it, um, there is this women's bodies... Um, welcome another being inside a baby that's created the baby gets put outside but initially when you're in your mother's stomach you get hungry you get fed you're a little bit uncomfortable the body temperature all of a sudden rises like you know being inside a womb is meant to be supposedly the happiest things that ever happens because you are in a place of comfort and of joy and uh, you don't know that you're a different being from your mother mm. you know and and again this is all theory True. i i don't i i can't remember being born but then <laughs> all of a sudden <laughs> um yeah <laughs> this like nice super warm tiny environment like like disappears all that water goes away and all of a sudden you feel like there's something trying to kill you And you're, a lot of pain is inflicted in all of your tiny little body because, you know, you feel like there's something trying to kill you and you don't understand. And Indian philosophy say it's only when we learn to work with the pain that we're able to see the light. And so the contractions are painful. They're painful for the mother. They're painful for the baby. But they work together and the baby comes out to see the light. And then they're in mom's arms again and again. They cry and they say that being born is super traumatizing. I can imagine. I can imagine it's very traumatizing because there's too little information. There is enough um, of the nervous system developed that we know fear, that we know sadness, that we know safe and unsafe, and it can feel really unsafe um, to be born. And I think that that is the first trauma that we all had so when we came into trauma, then, yes, I was going to say. Gosh, okay. but, we, but that's when we learn our first big lesson in life. Mm. Work with the pain to see the light. Yeah. And so, um, and so then, you know, we're outside. And again, we cry, we get breastfed. We cry again, our nappy gets changed. We, you know, and so we're still thinking that we're part of mom. And then all of a sudden, mom starts taking more and more time to attend our needs. And then we're like, oh, wait, there is a separate being. I'm crying and I've been crying for five minutes and still nobody's coming. What is going on? And so this individuation between the mother and the child starts to happen. And that's when the ego starts to form. Mm. But again, this is all theory. Yeah, um, This is all Adults imagining what it would like to be a baby again. And, you know, knowing how the world, how the brain works, I think that there is some truth into that. I'm not sure that it's all truth. But then this is why they say then from based on this, that we all want to go back to that being inside of our mother's body. And when we crave a partner or a relationship, we crave kind of like that oneness again. That like ideal person. Situation. Yes, that bonding. I that see. yeah, I see. It, it, it sounds somewhat true. I don't yeah, know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There is a very in, in, incredible book called Necessary Losses, okay. um, by Judith. Vo is it by Judith Forrest? Yes, it by Judith Judith Forrest, and she she talks about all of these kind of like experiences that we need to like learn to lose in life mm -hmm. um, to be able to go into the next stage, mm -hmm. um, and you know dealing with imperfect connections with other beings and you know, losing our mother in order to form another imperfect connection for, with another human being is part of that cycle mm -hmm. of of that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one of your answers was, um, one of your hardest moments was to do with relationships. It was um, finding out your partner had been cheating on you. Um, so yes and no. Then I, then that's when I said, I think that I went through something harder, like, okay. like fear wise. Um, Yes, that was very difficult, and it had to be um, overcome. That was a partner, you know. Would it be right if I asked you about that regardless? I know you wanted to talk e about something else. But, yeah. But, um, how, how was it able to overcome? Yeah, but I, I think um, 
I'm I'm curious to know about um, how your your view of relationships has evolved over your life, and mm -hmm. how, and, and where that sort of fitted in in that journey. Uh, wow. So that's a very personal question. So it I is. yeah, and because I'm a therapist, and I don't want any of my clients to know sure. that much more um, information about my life, I'm gonna keep it very very surfaced. Absolutely. Um, uh, and it's basically, I think that there is, I think that learning that human beings are filled with mistakes and are filled with um, defects and learning that no one is perfect and that forgiveness can, you know, be a great um, creator of a bond, um, you know, is very important. But the, you know, overcoming that um, can be very painful. And people will try and take sometimes the importance or the the deepness of the wound. Um, and, and of course, there are different levels of cheating. You know, there are affairs, there is a one night stand, there is a kiss, there is a, I started seeing this other person, but nothing happened while I was with you. And so I'm not going to go into any of those details. But the way that I approached it with my partner back then um, was that I told him, you know, the problem is not that you, you know, that you cheated. That is actually a consequence of something that is, you know, bringing you unhappiness that our relationship is not enough. And that is something that we need to work on. Mm. And then I have to see if I'm able to forgive you or not. But but it was, and, and so, yeah, one of the things is like, you need to understand what it, why this is not enough. Why you feel that you need, you know, more attention or more things from something else. Um, where is that fear coming from? And so that made me also discover that a lot of the people that cheat um, are very insecure, tremendously insecure. And so it helped me also find compassion mm. for them and for that partner at that time. Mm. That's beautiful. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So I want to ask about, yeah, so no, so sorry, but you said that actually there was another, afterwards you said you'd wish there was yeah, something Yeah, that's can when I, I... Can I get to me that water bottle out of the way, actually? Just oh, sorry, this. yes. No, it's um, fine. I think it's fine. Um, yeah, yeah the, sorry, you said there was a, a harder <laughs> moment, actually, you wish you'd said. Well, there so. was one very intense. I wouldn't say it was harder, but it was very intense. And that's the moment where I understand, I understood the shitting your pants out of fear, <laughs> um, uh, you know, expression. And um, I was, we were with my parents and I was, we had just come back from the UK, actually. And we were traveling from Quito, Ecuador, uh, back into Colombia. And so we had been in Peru and in Machu Picchu and with my parents and my sister. And we were doing this big road trip and we hadn't been really paying attention to the news. And that day that we were coming back in through the border from Ecuador into Colombia, we were passing through a very complicated region back then. It was called El Cauca. And uh, there was this war kind of thing between guerrillas. There was a lot of kidnapping going on, and the guerrilla had taken over the town that we were going to pass through. And we didn't really, you know, um, one of the things that they told you back in the day to pay attention is if you are on the road and there are no road, like no cars coming in the opposite directions, because these are not big highways. Colombia is a super mountainous um, country with very small bingly bongly roads that have one direction going to the north and the other one coming through the south. And so, you know, you're always crossing um, cars. And they told you if you don't see cars passing in the opposite direction, stop. Stop because it's very likely that there's been um, a retén, um, which is like they, they halt, like they make a stop thing and they start kidnapping people. So stop. And we had passed through a, um, a tall that had been blown up. And we were like, oh, that's odd. And uh, there were some guys that were dressed in military, but they weren't wearing proper military boots. That was the way that you would recognize military versus guerrilla. Everybody was wearing camouflage, but military had proper uniforms and guerrilla um, had rubber boots like wellies. Um, and they were wearing black wellies. And we're like, that's weird. And so we continued driving down and 
my father was sitting in the front with my sister and my mom was in the back because we always rotated uh, the shotgun, the front seat. And all of a sudden, all of the cars came to a halt and all of these guys came out of the bushes from the side. Um, and I looked and my mom is like, oh, look, it's the army. And my sister said, no, look at their boots. They're gorilla. And then when we turned around, they had a red and, and black thing on their arm. And it said, um, I think it said ELN, which was a ter- uh, Ejército de Liberación Nacional, which is one of the current guerrilla groups that still hasn't done the peace treaty with the Colombian government in Colombia. And we were like, oh, shoot. And all of a sudden, I looked down and my mom's legs were shaking. And as soon as I do- saw that, my legs started shaking. And I felt all of my sphincter control. All of a sudden, you feel like you need to pee, you need to go to the toilet, mm-hmm. you need to, your body needs to evacuate everything uh, out of your flight, system. Sort yes. Of response, yeah. Yes. Central nervous system kicks in. And this guy comes up and he knocks on my sister's window and my father says, like, he signals, like, no, come around. And so the guy comes around and he starts asking my father questions. What are you doing? Where are you coming from? And we had a super old Mitsubishi wagon Jeep, but it's a really good, like, car for if you want to go into the, you know, mountains. And it's because it's a four by four. It's big. You can fit eight people in there. But it was old. It wasn't anything luxurious. We always wanted to keep, like, a very, you know, low profile. And my father's like, no, we're coming on holiday. We didn't know what was going on. We had to take the car because we don't have enough to afford the flights and, you know, and, you know, just keeping. And they're like, I was like, yeah, okay, I'm going to find out uh, in the front with my general. And every time that my father talked back to the guy, he like, he, he made him like higher in like military rank. You know, he started with like cadet and now he was like captain. And, And so, but his voice was very calm. And all I could fear, as soon as the guy went out, all I could fear my father say was like, oh, what a shame, what a shame. Como, que vaina, que vaina. It's all that he said. It was a very Colombian expression. And um, and I just remember just feeling the most intense fear. I thought, we're going to get kidnapped. This is it. This is the end of us. You know, God knows what's going to happen. Soon as the guy went away, a lot of the truck drivers and the people that were standing around came down up to ask my father. And they're like, what did they say? What did he want? What did? And my father said, no, they were asking about the car. Maybe they want to, you know, ask for the car and borrow the car if they need errands or whatever. That's another thing they did. They took cars from people or property for people and, you know, they just didn't care. Yeah. And, um, and they're like, oh, be careful. You know, the guy that was bringing the onions, all of his merchandise already like rotted. They stole all of the merchandise from the guys from the Coca-Cola. They, you know, and I was just like, God. And I also remember seeing that all of these were kids with AK-47s. They were not older than 16 or 17 year olds. And they were out there, you know, most of them probably not, you know, believing in what was there, but they had also been forced into having a war that wasn't even theirs because that's what they did. That's how they recruited um, people in, in Colombia. And so all of a sudden something happened in the front and all of them went back into the bush So we didn't know if army was coming. And if army was coming, then it's even more dangerous because you're caught in the crossfire. Or what was going on? All of a sudden, they disappeared. And the guy in front of us, like, just kind of, like, overtook the, 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 the same thing. And my father just started following him. And so we started moving again. And then we went to another halt. And we were like, oh, shoot, again, another thing. So the guy in front of us, um, he had a white Hilux, Toyota Hilux, and he picked up. He got off um, in a store and asked something and came back and then jumped in the car. He turned around and he took on to the other direction. And my father, out of instinct, he said, this guy knows what he's doing. I'm going to follow him. And he took us through a back road. Um, and so we were not going through the main road, but by an unpaved road through the back, like through, you know, a jungly part. Yeah. We could have been going to the main, like, camp site yeah. where they were. But fortunately, that took us in through to another road. There was no Google Maps, no yeah. internet, no cell phones at this time. This is 1997. Cell phones are just arriving to Colombia. So we had no idea. 
Um, but then we found out, so it took us to the main road called, um, and that led us to a small, to the next big town called Popayan. And so we stayed the night there in Popayan. We didn't make it all the way to Cali. And then we turned on the news. And when we realized they had taken over the, the, the town that was right in front of us and they were bombing it with, um, they used to get gas uh, cylinders and fill them with debris, nails, um, you know, all, and they would just throw them so they would explode and create a lot of damage um, to the population. And so it was horrendous. And it was basically what the guerrilla was calling that day. It was the goodbye or the farewell of the government of, um, I think it was San Pedro Pastrana, one of those presidents and the incoming of the other one. And so we were like, we escaped by the skin of our teeth. Um, and it was, that was very, very, very scary wow. and I had a hard time sleeping after that for some time yeah, yeah. I wonder how um, how you reflect on those near misses now and and how they have impacted you in your life well I think I've always been very wary of my whereabouts or who I'm with or if somebody's following me um, you know if, if I'm in the scooter here during the pandemic there were a lot of girls that were um, always posting about these group of guys, um, really? that, you know, um, yeah, stealing their phones or things like that, like coming down from Ubud, because there was there was a lot of necessity. There wasn't a lot of income, and there were yeah, and so petty theft started to come up here. And so I'm always, especially at night as a girl, I'm always looking in my rearview mirror to see if it's the same scooter that's following me. So there is a little bit of paranoia yeah. and and that sense that that not completely fully sense of security. Um, Did it make you quite vigilant then? Not hyper, hyper vigilant, no, but just kind of more vigilant than the average person? Uh, I probably, yeah. probably. You know, I lock my doors before going to bed. I, um, yeah, I feel safe most of the times, but at night or when I know that I'm in a situation of you know, where I could be alone and I could be exposed, then I'm, we have a very Colombian expression. It's called no dar papaya, which means don't give out a papaya or don't put out a papaya because giving papaya means exposing yourself or, you know, maybe potentially in, like putting yourself in a situation of danger. Okay. Yeah. So there's a couple more things I want to ask you about. Mm -hmm. um, so you now live in Bali. Yes. How did we end up here? <laughs> um... I came here with my current partner, who I met in Vietnam after that big breakup, yeah. um, twice. And the second time that he came, we came over, he was like, oh, you know, what if we move to Bali <laughs> and uh, maybe we set up a little guest house or do this was in 2016? Maybe, yeah, 2016. And and he like planted that little bug in my head. And that little bug started crawling really quickly. And then shortly after that, we had, I think we had already moved to Da Nang. Da Nang is a lovely small town in the center of Vietnam, but nothing happens in Da Nang. <laughs> and I was going a little so, bit insane. Sounds like for you that might be a yeah. good thing at times. <laughs> No, because it was um, it was actually where the American military base was because right. whoever controlled Da Nang had half of the country. Right. Okay. So, um, you know, it was a lovely place, but a lot of our friends um, worked in the tourism industry. My uh, current partner is a pilot. And so, um, you know, pilots or people that work in hotels or in restaurants or that have hotels or restaurants have free days on a Wednesday or on a Tuesday or on a Monday. They never, like, have weekends off. And I was having a really hard time. They would have very tiny expat community, and I was really having a hard time finding work. I was teaching yoga, um, and I was seeing, like, one or two clients, but I was going a little bit insane. Um, and so I told my partner, dude, I'm moving to Bali. I don't know what you're doing with your life, but I'm getting out of here. I had a couple of friends that had moved here, and I thought, if they can make it work, so can I. Yeah. And so 
um, it was really lucky because when he went back to Spain to renew his pilot license, the people that were doing the thing for him told him, go to Bali with your partner. We can actually give you, you know, a job in Jakarta. We are looking for trainers for the Airbus 320. My partner flies an Airbus. And so, you know, you can start teaching people to fly now and then just have a much more comfortable schedule because pilot schedules are insane. He was working most of the time from 11 p.m. to 4 or 3 a.m. Oh. And then during the day he was sleeping. And so I was completely alone because we our lives crossed. Uh, you know, we we met on the way in or out of bed. That was it. Um, and so he went ahead and he did that. And so we came and we made our life here. And so he still works as a flight instructor. Um, he goes now to Bangkok. Um, to, you know, work 15 days on, 15 days off, and then I stay here and, uh, yeah, and put together my private practice. It took me a bit more time to understand um, what it worked like in Indonesia and what the the expat here was, how different it was from the expat in Vietnam. And so it took me a bit to kind of get that uh, ball rolling. I also, you know, ventured into making a website. I learned what SEO words were. <laughs> it took me like a year to get them right <laughs> until finally people started uh, finding me online at arttherapybali.com. Um, we'll and... put all the links in the description, of course. Sorry? We'll put all the links in the description oh, yes, of the video, please, of course. Oh, yes, please, please awesome yeah just so if people are curious or want to find out more they can contact me and and so yeah that's that's what brought us here and it's just a very nice you know people a lot of people come to bali to, to you know to connect to themselves to heal to explore and so it's a great place to have an art therapy practice I, I, I believe i'm not sure i'm not certain i've looked but i think that i'm the only licensed art therapist in the island there are other people that say that they do art therapy um but they don't have a psychological degree okay. um, that backs them up or that and i'm sure that they're lovely and they help people as well um well, we hope but so. Yeah, well, we would hope so. But <laughs> but yeah, but but there is a licensing procedure. There is a number of hours that people need to have. Uh, there needs to be some professional development um, having, you know, going on to be able to keep up, let's say, with that license kind of thing. Um, yeah. And so I think at the moment I am the only one um, or because I've looked online and I, you yeah, know, there yeah. are other people that say that they have art therapy, but they do art as therapy, which mm -hmm. is a different thing. Yeah. That, yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, well, no, well, that's well. That's sort of what I assumed it was when I first heard it. So it's been yeah. really great to to learn about it. Um, you said that your most frequent lie is "I'll be there on time." <laughs> so you've obviously <laughs> assimilated well into the culture here, anyway. Well, that's actually from my culture. In oh, Colombia, really? yeah. everybody is late. <laughs> in part because we have insane traffic. So please don't blame the Balinese. Blame the traffic. <laughs> um, and um, in part because we just my, don't... My, produ my producer's laughing over there. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure it's because of the traffic, though. <laughs> but we just also don't take life so seriously. Like, we're very much unlike the British in that sense. <laughs> it's like, if you are here, you have to be on it. We're like, oh. <laughs> five minutes more, five minutes less, you know, whatever. I am like as that. long as, as as long as you deliver what it, what is five minutes more or five minutes sure. less? I mean, unless it's a flight, then it's a, then, then it's a different deal. Yeah. 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 Five five minutes is tolerable. Yeah. So just to wrap up, I, I there's one question I'd really like to ask you, which is how do you think childhood you would react if she saw adult you and what you've achieved and what you're doing and, and how you live your life and the kind of person you've, you've become. Oh, she'd give me a high five. Yeah. She'd be like, good on you for going to Bali and eating half of the world. <laughs> I always keep telling my, my partner, okay, when is Africa coming? We need to move to Kenya or to Namibia or to, <laughs> and do that side of the world. And he's like, but we're in Bali. What else do you want? And I get itchy feet. I love living in different places. I love exploring. I love going to new cultures, learning how, you know, things work. And yeah, she'd be proud. That's absolutely fantastic. She'd be proud. I love hearing that. Because, <laughs> you know, that's that's so interesting and lovely though, because there's uh, so many people um, look back on how they were when they were younger and they sort of have a self-loathing, you know, almost like, oh, no. you know. Oh, no, I love my little me. And that's amazing. Yeah. I know that's so important to have that yeah. relationship with that younger self in your head where it's like, oh, you look back on you and you're like, yeah, you, you went through a lot. Like, that's amazing that you did went through yeah. those things and you've come, come, come to where you've come to. Yeah, and there's a lot of like healing through the inner child that can happen through through art therapy. I bet, I was thinking that actually. There's this were. amazing book that I love working with um, by Lucia Capaccioni and it's called, um, God, the... Some, it's healing your inner child, basically, but it's an art 
therapy workbook and so you go with your client or I go through the through the through the patient my, my client I don't like to call them patients yeah. um I you know I get them to read it and then they either do the drawings in my presence or they do the drawings for homework and then we discuss them in my presence and it's about learning to rescue that little boy or that little girl that lives within you that really just needs to be loved and really needs to be taken care of and and really wants the best for you Because at the end of the day, when you said at the beginning of our conversation that we're all, you know, little children wrapped in people's, in older people's body. Yeah, yeah. we are. Yeah. But we need to go back and take care of that little, you know, girl or boy Absolutely. every now and then and, 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 you know, tell them that it's fine, that you will take care of them. Yeah. And that's, a, it's actually a great tool for learning to develop self-love. It's, it's amazing. I love that. Yeah. Natalia, thank you so much for this conversation. It's been you absolutely fantastic. are very welcome. Thank you so much for hosting me. It's it's the first time that this happens. Oh, actually, no, the anxiety guy once interviewed me, but I don't know if that ever <laughs> went online or not. Uh, but, um, no, well, but yeah. Well, no, well, it's been amazing. And, um, and this, where, where can people... Um, So they can Google Art Therapy Bali and my website is www.arttherapyandcreativity.com. And uh, I think it's creativity or creativity development. Ooh, uh, they, if they put Art Therapy Bali, yeah, I think that it should be fine. So yeah, it's there. The Instagram account is also there. Linked as Art Therapy Bali. Um, I'm not a very active social media person. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very old school in that sense. Uh, I try and make an effort of post and write little blogs for my website every now and then. Um, yeah, yeah. But they, if they want to learn more, they can definitely. And if they're in, oh, no. I won't say that because if they're <laughs> if they're in Bali, this won't be released by the time that that talk is happening. So it doesn't okay. make sense. Okay. No well, look, thank, again, thank you so much, and uh, yeah, I just really appreciate your time. Thank you so much for having me, Harry. It was a pleasure. Thank you.